Welcome back to New Mexico Entertainment Television, where you continue to be in the know with all things events and entertainment in New Mexico. My name is Teresa Robinson, and on this month's episode, we'll be covering topics from our October issue, which is our fall issue. So, let's get started. That first note sets the tone, and Mukulisiwe Goomba has delivered it on stages around the world. Today we talk with her about playing Rafiki in The Lion King coming to Pope Joy Hall, the experience of being on tour, and what this production means to her. Mugulisi Wade, thank you for taking time out to talk with me because I know you're busy on this tour. And just to say, how many tours is this for you now with The Lion King? This is my second tour because I started in Madrid in 2011. That's why I started to join Lion King in 20, 2011 in Madrid. So I was there one and a half year. And then I came here to join Gazal Tour in America. So from 2013 to 2017. Wow. So yeah, this is my second touring company here in America, yes. Being a South African on Broadway, and you're one of six in this show. I mean, could you have envisioned being on Broadway as a performer? Never, ever. <laughs> I've never even dreamed of it. Like, you know, when you're watching TV, you are like, you're looking all these stars. I'm like, oh my God, one day is it me? I'm going to be there. I've never even dreamed of that. The first email I got, I was uh, I, I was going to join Gazelle. Mm -hmm. So I was in Spain. So they have to flew me back to South Africa so that I can prepare my visa to come here in America. So while I was still in that preparation, I got another email saying, we want, we want you to come and join Broadway Company. I was like, wait, is it a prank? Because I'm preparing <laughs> myself to go and join <laughs> Gazelle. So I sent the email back. I was like, okay. I understand it's the same person who sent me this email when you were hiring me for Gazelle Tour. So now I'm getting another email. So what's going on? Is it a prank or what's going on? He was laughing. He was laughing. He said, oh, no, Muge, it's the same company. But of course, the Broadway company, it's a sit down. The Gazelle Tour, it's a touring company. So of course, we will, we will want to have you on Broadway for this certain period of time. And then you have to go back to rejoin the, uh, the tour. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't even hesitate. I said, yes, I'm in. You have the note that is the defining tone of the show. Even with being a kid and watching The Lion King, just the animated, still watching that and seeing that sunrise come up and be, what is it like playing this character? Girl, between me and you, people that don't understand, every time, every day, when I have to start at note, I just want to cry. My stomach will start rumbling. I'll be like, oh Jesus, did I got it right? Is it, is it gonna be a right note? Every day. But as soon as I hit that note, I'll be like, okay, this is it. So I wanna take a step back and actually talk about how you began uh, okay. performing. I mean, what, what was the drive for you to want to be a performer? I always say um, coming from a family where I think it's it's within my family because my family we like we like to sing. I will applaud my family because they're uh, especially my mom because she was the one. Even when I have to go, uh, even in school, I used to sing in choirs. We will have competition in school. But as soon as I grow up, one of my teachers in high school, she said, "You know what? I just want to tell you." I know you you are smart, but I see something in you. I wish you can follow your dream because I can see a talent in you. I see you like in big stages performing. Like, yeah, Mbongeni uh, he's a well-known person in South Africa because he is the founder of uh, Sarafina. So I went to do auditions to Mbongeni and then he took me. He, he had like a, a school, a school of art where he was is teaching music, uh, uh, acting and dancing at the same time. So 
that's where I would say that's where I saw that I do have a talent because that's where I started to to know how to use my voice, how to to act a little bit, how to dance, how to move my body. So yeah. <laughs> what was it like for you the first time you stepped on stage for this I show? Cried. I cried. I cried. Like when a uh, first number and then hearing these voices coming all over, like, you know, when you pinch yourself every day, girl, yes, this is you, you are here. Yeah, you are one of them. Yes, you are doing this show. Like it was like that thing every day. As soon as we go on stage to put puppets, everything, whew, wow. I applaud Julie Tema for creating that vision. Like mm. he did an amazing job like to put like a human being to put that person in in, in a pub because before i used to say even when i was watching it on on stage i was like it doesn't look like those are actual people like i soon but i'm like no those are real people they are the one who are live making all this puppet being alive it's amazing it's amazing gazelles, gazelles uh elephant i'm like who like I don't know what what was she thinking when she was thinking all of this, like all these more details. But when you look up everything, I'm like, wow, 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 wow. So I I know you're working on this tour, but what can we expect from you in the future? Any upcoming projects we should know about? Um, I'm thinking of having uh, maybe a single. I will start with a single. I have to record something. Because I like gospel. I like gospel a lot. So, yeah, I'm still thinking about that. Uh, it's not there yet. It's something that I'm thinking about. I just want to have a single and, yeah. <laughs> Mokalisiwe, thank you. Thank you again. It has been a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. I'm excited to have the show coming back to New Mexico. And for those yeah. who haven't seen it, they're going to be amazed. I, that I'll have to say they need to come in numbers they will never miss a thing yes they will never miss a thing thank you so much for having me thank you thank you so much The award-winning annual event, Night of the Living Cover Bands, is something everyone should experience. Local bands transform themselves into some of music's greatest artists, pulling them out of their comfort zones and taking their performances to another level. Producer Bonnie Lopez joins us tonight to tell us what we can expect from this year's show. Okay, so Barney, thank you for letting me bug you over here at Launchpad yeah, during yeah. your work day so we could talk more about... Uh, Night of the Living cover band. So first, I want to say congratulations on your award win. Thank you very much. So how it's, does it feel? Oh, it's, it was very exciting and surprising, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny. On stage, you talked about how, you know, how did I beat out the balloon fiesta? But I, I don't know if you realize, because so many people reached out during the event that talked about that event mm -hmm. and just the, the accolades that they have for you on and what's done with it. I can understand why you won that award. Why do you think this particular event just seems to resonate with people? Um, I mean, it's a really big event for the whole music community. It kind of touches a bunch of different music scenes in town, uh, both like experienced musicians and new musicians and musicians that like come together just to kind of put together a special band. Yeah. So we'll see a lot of like crossover bands that will happen. Like, and I think there's just this kind of like 
joyous unity that the music community gets to experience together. And I think that that is like, that's the fun part. Yeah. That's what makes it more like a, it's an Albuquerque event. It's a local event, right? We're like Balloon Fiesta is a tourist event. Tour exactly. I was I was just saying yesterday, I was like, man, we should just raise the prices for Balloon Fiesta so we can get all those tourist <laughs> money and then like let locals in really cheap and then help our economy all year long. That'd be great. Oh, well, it's, it's definitely a great event to go to. And I, I, you know, we got to talk about this some last year, but I, do they, do the bands pick their choices of who they're going to cover? Yeah, they do. So usually what I do is I have like a sign up form or I'll reach out to bands that I know uh, that play locally here in town and ask them if they want to play it. And I'll have them give me two options. So because often a lot of bands will pick the same, the same. I would figure There's that's some gonna popular happen. ones. Then it comes to me to be like, oh, well, both of you asked for this. Uh, I think this band asked first, or I'd rather see this band do this. Mm -hmm. Can you go with your second choice, or can you give me a different choice? Because sometimes even both their choices are taken. So yeah. if it's a situation, I mean, do you find it that the bands themselves, with the choices that they're making, that it's outside, are they stepping out of their comfort zone in order to do this? It, de it depends. It depends. I try and encourage it. I, I usually am more excited by bands that step outside of their comfort zone. Like, there's like a hard rock band doing Elvis this year. I think it's Amped Owl Drive oh. is doing Elvis, which I'm like, all right, cool. That's different from like what your band normally is. Because for me, it feels also kind of like an artistic e exercise. Yeah. Right? Where, like, musicians, part of the ways that we, like, have learned to play is by learning covers. But this is, like, the next level where you get to take a deep dive into a catalog of one musician and learn, like, five songs. And for me, every time I've done it as a musician, I feel like I grow. Like, I kind of learn. Like, I did No Doubt one year. And I got to learn how to play bass like Tony Canal from No Doubt. And I was like, this guy's amazing. Oh, my God. And, like, it, it changed me. You know, as a yeah. musician, it, it helps push you in new directions. And I think when you choose something that's outside of your comfort zone, the results are, are usually amazing. So if I, if I read something correctly, and I don't know if it's happened every year, is there an all-ages um, element this year with yeah. the event? Yeah, so for the first time ever, we're doing an all-ages element. So when, we, when we've done it in years past, we've had plenty of people comment like, oh, bummer, why, why does it have to be 21 plus? This yeah. doesn't make sense. And like, <laughs> I get the sentiment like totally as like coming, I came to Launchpad for the first time at the age of 16 to see O Ranger play and, and left and said, so I like, I know the desire to want to go <laughs> exactly. to something really cool. And so this year we decided to add Sundays and we made Sundays all ages. And oh, the awesome. majority of the bands that are playing on Sundays are younger bands. There's like bands from School of Rock, there's bands from Rock 101, there's like brand new bands that uh, some of them I think will be playing their very first show at the oh, Launchpad wow. at, for a Night of the Living cover band. So oh. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. So let's talk about some of the, because um, we can't even about to cover all the bands that are taking part oh, in this yeah. event and with all the nights happening. So. What are some of the, who are some of the bands that are coming out this year that are doing things that you're you're liking that you're liking to see? Yeah. Um, okay. So this year we have uh, over 130 bands, which is the most ever, and from what we can tell online, is the biggest cover band festival in the world. Oh There's like a, a tribute band festival in Ireland that has like 115 bands, and we're like, I think we beat them. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was like, Dave, were you even reaching for that goal? It just kind of, I mean, kind of. When we added the All Ages shows, we realized that my, someone told me last year about this other uh, cover band festival, and I was like, well, if we had these All Ages shows, I mean, we might be oh, able to reach that number. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah there's some great ones. Uh, so, uh, Suspended, uh, they're a local metal band, mm -hmm. really great. They're going to be doing Judas Priest this year, Ooh, nice. which is going to be amazing. Uh, Dust City Opera is doing Muse this year. They're a big favorite in town. Uh, there's also the uh, Prairie Dog is this new band that's teaming up with Russian Girlfriends to do Queens of the Stone Age, Ooh. and that will be really neat. Um, uh, Casey Mraz last year with Los Metamorphos, he did uh, Carlos Santana on mm -hmm. accordion, and that was like one of the highlights. Uh, <laughs> this year he's doing Steely Accordy Dan, so it's uh, I just want to imagine it's it's a <laughs> Steely Dan on accordion. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, 
I'm trying to remember some other ones. Uh, I'm I'm doing Blink 182 this year oh my with a, with a couple of the dudes. Uh, there's a No Doubt. Willa J is doing No Doubt. Mango Cakes are doing Silk Sonic. Ooh, oh, ooh, yeah, ooh yeah, okay. Right. That one's gonna be good. Yeah. That one's gonna be good. And then there's this like collab with some of the Mango Cakes players and some of the Slums of Harvard players, and they're doing uh, Mac Miller on the first weekend. Oh my goodness. Yeah, which is gonna be like a really cool. Yeah, there's so many like really interesting choices. Someone's doing Lamb of God this year, which I'm like, what? No one's ever like even <laughs> tried to do like serious death metal. Like it's like so that'll be really cool. There's one night that has like a lot of lady rock star like lady superstars. Oh awesome. Like we've got Lady Gaga's on that night. Sorry Weto is doing Britney Spears that night. <laughs> Uh, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. No, so, that's, right. so, so, okay, so we just talk about Sorry Widow because every year they are like <laughs> the best, if not one of the best cover bands, and they always push themselves in a way different direction. Because Sorry Widow, if you're not familiar with, they are like a hardcore, yeah. really heavy band. They've done Prince before, which was amazing. When they did Prince, Ray showed up on a tiny little purple moped, and he drove it from the front of Launchpad. All the way to the back, like security clearing the way for Prince to come onto the stage, and then they perform this like, like Prince Wetolution, Prince and the Wetolution is what they call that one. Where can people get their tickets? Learn who who's all playing for this event? Where can they learn more? So they can go to launchpadrocks.com, and on there you can find tickets for every night. We're also selling fifty dollar festival passes, which it's oh, ten dollars yeah. a night, and so you're getting twelve nights. Yeah, there's twelve nights. It's every weekend in October, I don't Friday, know how to do Saturday, it. Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, right? So, so save money, buy the pass for fifty bucks, and get to come to all twelve of them, or however many you can come to. Uh, and all of the uh, all of the lineups are listed up on our website, launchpadrocks.com. Well, awesome. Thank you, Barney, again for letting me. Uh, talk more about Night of Living cover bands. It sounds awesome. I think it's going to be another great one this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> We're almost there. i got to start decorating. Oh, thank I'm you. No, I will let you get to yeah. it. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah, of course. Dark Red Film Festival is back for another year, and John Broadhead is presenting his film, The Art Painting, at this year's event. We stopped by the Guild Cinema, one of the festival's venues, to talk about the film and what he loves about the process. John, thank you for meeting with us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you for having me. you're uh, one of the filmmakers taking part in Dark Red. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually wanted to start with you. You are from here. You're a local filmmaker. I am. What do you feel is the reason that New Mexico is like the best backdrop for film? There's a, a very unique, um, just speaking of the vibe, the sort of landscapes here, um, the desert, in my experience, provides a lot of, I feel like there's something starkly beautiful about the landscape here, even about the people here. There's just a hard, a hard edge to it, yeah. if that makes sense, uh, which, which allows for some very intense storytelling um, and just, just Put the camera on on the desert landscape at sunset and and it just evokes something very powerful something wander lusty mm -hmm. and, and and it brings out some sense of angst and restlessness and it just i don't know it, that's always been a very creative um motivation for me inspiration and when it comes to the genres of film that you could be making what draws you what do you usually go towards in recent years i've been writing a lot more uh dark comedy mm -hmm. um which is actually what the art painting um, is, is, is dark comedy meets sci-fi meets psychological thriller. Um, and dark comedy is something that allows me to really delve into some of the darker aspects of human nature, but without getting bogged down in, in, in some of the more like really disturbing elements that you find in horror most mm -hmm. of the time. Dark comedy is a fun way of, of addressing very honest issues, um, but also without letting the feel like the, the, the feel of the film sink into something that becomes too uncomfortable. Well, tell us about um, the the art painting. Tell us a little bit more about this film. Um, I wrote the art painting um, about a year before we shot it, so early on in 2022. And my, my entire impetus for sitting down to write it was very simple. I just wanted to write something that involved one character in one room. 
so you know every indie filmmaker is like what could I do with that <laughs> um, but I also wanted to take that very simple concept and give it an, a fresh a fresh spin mm -hmm. so quickly I found myself um, writing something that was this nightmarish trip that uh, you know while also while functioning as a dark comedy also sort of becomes this classist commentary on the elitism of like um, I guess high art culture and and how there's this sort of separation between people who consider themselves artists and people who actually are kind of down in the dirt like creating art from their soul mm -hmm. um, and, and so in some ways it's a commentary on the artistic process um, but it's a film that I think takes some really fun unexpected turns what is your favorite part of the process that it's hard for me to separate the parts because I always approach uh, a project as as someone who writes and directs and edits my own films um, of course in collaboration with a team of extremely extremely talented people and I couldn't do it without cinematographer Giannis and uh, my gaffer uh, Charles Davies and just the, the cast of course um, but when I approach it it's all it's all one part of of the artistic process the the writing and the directing and the editing it's all it's all the same thing like in a sense when I'm editing the film it feels like a continuation of the screenwriting process it's just the natural flow and this is this is where it has has come out yeah, that's an interesting way um, to look at it and that but that being said I, I do think my favorite part of that process is is taking taking the footage that we've gathered and beginning to edit it where where I finally start to see the final form come together um, and I think a lot of filmmakers would probably agree with me that, that that's a lot of the stress of production is behind you and now mm -hmm. you're just sitting down and watching it take shape and you're like this is the thing that I was that I've been putting together that we've all been here doing we're finally seeing it here and then sending rough cuts to the to the cast and crew and seeing their responses to it being nice. like, oh this is exciting this is now we see what we've been working on it just it's a it's a really positive experience so what do you want the audience to walk away feeling after seeing your film I want them to walk away feeling a little bit <laughs> I think I think people's reactions are going to be different. Some people are going to be laughing a little. Some people are going to feel a little bit a little bit disturbed. Um, it's it's a film that ends on a a different note. Um, I I can't say too much without spoiling it. Absolutely. <laughs> but that's almost that's one of the fun things about doing projects that are very very indie and in, in that you're not obeying the rules of one specific genre. You're not abiding by the tropes that a lot of films need in order to function in Hollywood. You're able to get away with a lot of different storytelling techniques. And so every film that I make is kind of an experiment to see how people are going to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think I told a story that, that feels to me very honestly human, um, which is all I ever hope a movie, you know, will feel is that it's honest. Um, and so I hope I hope ultimately that people walk away feeling um, feeling entertained. This is the best thing they can leave me. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, that's that's you know at the end of the day that's all I can hope for. Well, John, thank you for joining us again today, and we're looking forward to seeing the film. Thank you so much.
Byland is a Seattle-based Albuquerque-raised singer-songwriter whose music invokes such emotion with every note that you can't help but walk away feeling something. Tonight, we're glad to have Allie Byland talk about her career, the band's new single, and coming home to perform on Bands of Enchantment. Yeah, and thank you again for taking the time out to, to talk with me before your performance with uh, uh, Bands of Enchantment. So I actually wanted to start with how your career began. How, where did the drive to um, start in music come from? I've been playing music for basically my whole life. And um, I, I moved to Seattle in 2008 um, when I was 18. <laughs> and I, there's, it's the city of music there. And I had a lot of experience growing up before I moved there. My, my dad was a pastor of a church in the inner city of Albuquerque and I got to play music. Um, I was a, like a, a group worshiper at our church for basically since I was 12. So I've just played music in a lot of different avenues. And when I moved to Seattle, I met my partner and we started writing music together and we started Byland and we recorded our first record in our closet. <laughs> and then uh, we met our producer, Nate um, Yasino, who's in Ballard up there. And we've been making music and recording at his studio for uh, two records now. So yeah, and the band that we have, I've, I've, I moved to New Mexico. I convinced my partner finally to move back to New Mexico, my hometown <laughs> um, in, in 2020. And uh, we were here for a couple of years and it was a beautiful, very, uh, it was tough in some ways and so so healing and really beautiful in other ways to be here during that time. Uh, we got to play with a band here in New Mexico full of all of my best friends. <laughs> so when we moved back up to Seattle, it was very sad to to leave to leave them. And we have a we have a band up there now that we're touring with. So there's a little snapshot. <laughs> so I just wanted to take a step back to when yeah. you were in Albuquerque. How long was your time here? Um, and just how did it if how did it influence your music? I mean, there's a lot of music in New Mexico, a lot of cultural music, and um, a lot of that is so inspiring to be around. Even just walking around an old town, you hear you hear music everywhere. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of our city. And um, I, I grew up around that. And I, I grew up in the inner city. And there's um, music was kind of a, a way to to express what I was going through. You know, being in being in that neighborhood and growing up growing up around a lot of heartache and and beauty <laughs> music is a an incredible way to process through all of that so it's always been a, a good friend to me your sound is really haunting I was just listening <laughs> to all things Albuquerque this morning and I I came to tears there were tears like streaming like not all it was like the absolute love letter to this town so I can tell yeah. how much it affected you your, your you. sound is so different from anybody that I've heard. I mean, do you did you have um, inspired people that inspired you um, during your process of uh, creating your sound? Um, and if you did, who were they? I grew up listening to Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash and Keith Green and all the all the folk lords. <laughs> and, yeah, <It> um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of them influenced like a lot of our songs lyrically. I would say and. Um, as far as musicality wise, I love this band, Manchester Orchestra. They play songs that aren't in 4-4. They play songs that are, you know, they change keys in the middle of a song. And I love, I love creating music that can catch people off, you know, catch them off guard a little bit, cause them to lean in and um, surprise you a little bit. So it's, it's, it's a really fun for me to make music like that. And it's, it's what I've been making for a while now. So thank, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> yeah, so it's a beautiful song. But let's talk about your new single, which actually inspired this tour. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, this song is is basically a, it's not quite a love letter, um, but it's, it's dedicated to my best friend who I grew up with. We played music. She's the first person I ever wrote a song with. And leaving her when we moved back to Seattle, in 2022 was uh, one of the most difficult goodbyes. It was saying goodbye to kind of a lifelong dream that we had always dreamed of. We thought we would tour the world together and we thought we would be playing music together. And when it came down to it, um, I had to move and, and she stayed. And 
the song is is dedicated to her and actually it's so wonderful I just got to see her play with her band at um, Meow Wolf last night so we're we're both on our journey and we can support each other from afar and it's funny that the song is called Monstera because when I moved uh, to New Mexico in 2020 I had this Monstera plant that only had two leaves on it. And when we moved back to Seattle, it had seven leaves on it. So it grew five leaves while we were here. And <laughs> actually funny enough, when we moved back to Seattle, it uh, all my plants died, oh, and, including, <laughs> that one, including that one. But it's it's sort of a reminder that even though, you know, if something dies, it, it still matters that I lived. And yep. yeah, so the song is dedicated to her. So how does it feel to be back home playing for bands of enchantment and their third season i mean i'm absolutely honored to be a part of this uh, lineup there's so many lo like beautiful local acts that I've, i actually have never even heard of like there's some that i have some that i haven't so it's a discovery process for me and and also just it feels it feels very uh very healing every time i come home i it's where i grew up it's beautiful to see all my friends and all my family and and the place that it has become is so beautiful to me so where can people learn more about you, your music, and this upcoming tour? Yeah, we're, I think we're mostly active on Instagram, the, you know, the, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, we keep that updated mostly, and we have Facebook. Uh, our band name is Byland, not by sea, but by land. Uh, it's, it's my and my, my husband's last name, so um yeah, we're on Instagram, Byland Music, and I think everywhere else we're Byland Music. Our website is bylandmusic.com. That's where you can find us. Well, Allie, thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time out and absolutely looking forward to your performance. Thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to playing in my hometown. <laughs> oh. This is your New Mexico Entertainment in 60. The Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta is back for another incredible year, creating an enchanted world of special shapes, twilight glows, and vibrant balloon-filled skies. The event takes place on October 7th through the 15th at Balloon Fiesta Park in Albuquerque. Ghouls on Parade makes its return to Knob Hill. The event has local performers, vendors, and fun for kids, followed by a costume parade. Ghouls on Parade takes place on October 28th at Morningside Park in Albuquerque. Gray Day 2023 is coming. Hip-hop duo Suicide Boys with special guests Ghost Main and City Morgue will perform live. The event takes place on October 27th and 28th at Tingley Coliseum in Albuquerque. This has been your New Mexico Entertainment in 60. For more events and entertainment, visit nmentertains.com. Thank you for tuning in to this month's episode of New Mexico Entertainment Television, where you continue to be in the know. Join us next month as we cover topics from our November-December issue, which is our holiday issue. Have a great night. For more events and entertainment, visit edmentertains.com.